Okay. So I'll just continue from where I stopped at the last time. Let me share my screen now. Okay, so this was where we stopped the last time, which is to get the final value of y of y of k. So the final value theorem. So in order to do that, we use the final value theorem. So the final value theorem states that the, the limits as t tends to infinity is equal to the limits when you multiply this with y or z. So a brief explanation in the final value theorem. You know, the, the Z transform is, a, um, is an infinite series. So we're supposed to continue k is equal to 5, k is equal to 6, k is equal to 7 till infinity. But the final value theorem helps us, helps us to, um, to get so that it just helps us to skip all those calculations so that we just get the final value of y of k. That's what um, the final value theorem helps us to do. So we want to be able to know, you know, for y is equal to, for y1, we have this, for y2, we have this, y3. So we want to know uh, the value at, the value at y is equal to infinity. So that's what the final value theorem does. And this is the final value theorem. So it says that this final value is the same thing as getting the limits of this function as, as z tends to one. That's what the final value theorem, theorem says. Then is in your notes. So let me go, uh, let me go back to the notes. Uh, in your notes, there are a lot of Z transform properties. Um, uh, the Z transform properties. So I made mention of some Z transform properties, multiplication, uh, translation, there's the initial value theorem. Initial value theorem allows you to get the initial value. Then the final value theorem. So this is from your is in your notes, uh, the third lecture. So this is where I got the final value theorem from. And let me go back to the lecture notes. Okay. So we have y of z. We got it as this. So we simply multiply this out. So when you multiply it out, you get this. Then you get the limit as z tends to 1. So simply replacing all occurrence of z with 1. All occurrence of z with 1. Um, then when you do the algebra, you get 1. So as, as t tends to infinity or as k tends to infinity, um the final value is one so in effect um if you keep going if you keep going on and on and on with this at when y is equal to infinity so at y is equal to infinity at y is equal to infinity y of infinity is going to be 1. So the final value theorem um, makes us not to just continue doing the calculation on and on. So it just tells us the value when k tends to um, infinity. 
So we've done, we've completed the first example. So the, so the next, I'm going to be going into the modified Z transform. And effectively, what the modified Z transform allows us to do is that, you know, for the normal Z transform, K is an integer. So you have K at, um, you have k at integer values, k is equal to one, k is equal to two, k is equal to three. The modified Z transform allows us to get the, the output at instant sampling times. So how about if we want to get like for this, if we want to get y of, uh, if we wanted to get y of 5.1, how can we get it? So the, the modified Z transform allows us to get the value of the output at intersampling times because the normal Z transform, you can only get the output at um, K, when K is equal to one, K is equal to two, K is equal to three integer values, but the modified Z transform allows us to get the value of the output at intersampling time. So now you are dealing with um, real numbers, numbers with uh, des decimal points. And so that's what we call the modified Z transform. So I'll be representing the modified Z transform uh, using an example. So we're going to be using the last example. So this is basically the last example. The same plant in continuous time, uh, the same representation, and um, using the uh, step invariant discretization. And we are asked to get the output um, for the closed loop system, determine the modified Z transform for a unit step input. So all of the questions, um, the question is the same thing, but now you have to get the modified Z transform and also to, um, to get it at this intersampling time at M to prove that when M is equal to one, why the modified Z transform becomes the original Z transform. And also to get the output values when M, in this case, M is the intersampling time. Uh, sorry, I didn't define, M is the intersampling time. So we want to be able to get um, when M is 0 0.5 or in steps of 0 0.5, want to be able to get the output. So in summary, the modified Z transform, in summary, the modified Z transform allows us to get the value of the output at intersampling times, not at integer sampling times, but at um, decimal, uh, when you have decimal fraction, you want to get the value of the output. By the time we, we do an example, we complete this example, you're going to understand. So this is the question we had previously, but now you have this, um, you have this delay, then M is going to be from, is between zero to one. So M is like a delay in order to get the, modified Z transform. We want to uh, we want to get the we impute a fictitious delay. I want to get the value of the output at a specific sampling time that is not integer. So that is actually a real number that has decimal points. So in order to in order to do this, I uh, will make use of two formulas. So this is the formula to get the output using the modified Z transform. So remember there is a 
gz of m where the gz of m is the modified z transfer function then this gz comma m this is the formula we're going to use to get it so we are using the residue method and you're going to multiply the original transfer function with this then we get the residues at the poles of g of s so if you remember i i did not prove how you obtain this formula i didn't um i didn't prove it so because the proof is actually quite uh, complicated than it's uh, you're going to see the proof in any control digital control systems and uh, there's book so so i'm just giving you the formula here so we are going to use this formula to get the G, gz comma m if you look at this residue method we've done the residue we've used this residue method before and we've used it in our first class we use it in our first class and in the first class we use the residue method so i'll just i'll just go back to the uh to the first method where we used it because at that time somebody asked me a question that can we so uh let me okay okay so when we when we did this class so this was our first class when we did this class we used the residue method let me go to that point um So in this case, I told you that I explained how to use the, uh, the residue method. So this was the formula we used. Then we used it to, to find the inverse Z transform. So now I'm including because at that time, somebody asked a question that, is it possible to use this method when you have triples? So I'm creating an example where you have triples. Now, I'm creating as an example where you have triples. Then we are using the residue method to find the inverse Z transform. I'll still go back to our normal lecture. So the residue method says that you find the limit of this as Z tends to the pole. Uh, so in this question, we have triples. So uh, expanding out this equation because summation so you have to sum up because we have three poles so you have um, three summations here so you include the first pole here you multiply you know that this is our equation so you multiply the first summation by the first pole the second summation by the second pole then the third summation by um, the last pole, then you find the limit for the first one as z is equal to one, because you have z is equal to one here. You find the limit as z is equal to 0 0.7, because you have 0 0.7 here. Then you find the limit as z is equal to 0 0.5. So uh, I'm doing this example because when we add that class, somebody asked a question that. Can we use it for when you have three poles? Can you use the residue method? So when you, you do the mathematics, the algebra, you're going to get, it's further simplified into this. So when you plug in the limits of the three, you're going to get this. Then when you uh, expand and simplify, you're going to get this. So this is the method of use, uh, this is the residue method. So let's go back to uh, this lecture. So now we are back to the residue method now. But now 
is actually much more complicated using this example. So I'll be using this example. So I'll be explaining it. But first of all, you know we already have our g of z. So and our our g sorry our g of s, and since we are representing it, uh, we are combining it with the zero order hold. This is the zero order hold. So it becomes this with the original formula. Then we already know, we already proved that our G H O G of Z is given by this equation. So what we simply do here is to replace uh, this with this. So the equation becomes um, is translated into this. So when you uh, put this z minus one divided by z a, then you combine it with s to get this. So our g of s, but yeah, we simply replace our g of s yeah divided by s. So you have s squared a, and we are supposed to and want to get the residue. So we want to use the uh, residue method to, to get um, G, Z, M. Now, so when we do some simplification, we get this. And some further simplifications, we are going to arrive at this. So we want to get the modified Z transform at the poles of G of S. So here, we have this at the poles of G of S. We have S is equal to zero, but you have a repeated pose because you have S squared. So this is, this pole is repeated. Then you have uh, at this pole. So we separated out this particular equation. We separated that it out into two. Remember, there's a summation A. So since we have, this is a repeated pole. So at, um, let me put repeated pole. S is equal to zero. So this is for this pole. Then you have to find the residue at this pole when S is equal to uh, minus 0 0.5. So um, we broke it down into this and this because of this summation here. So we'll find the residue at this pool. Then we'll find the residue at this pool. Then the formula, when you have a repeated pool, the formula you use, so let me just go to the last page. I put the formula there. So when you have a, the repeated pool, pool, this is the method you use to get the residue. So the limit at Z tends to A, which is at that repeated pool, where N is the order of the pool. You know in that question, N was two because we have two repeated pools. So this is going to be replaced with two, and this is going to be replaced with two. Then if it, you have the extinct poles, the poles are not repeated, you will use the normal method that I used to illustrate the last example. So we simply use that method. So when we plug in the method, so when we plug in the formula into the, we plug in our specific example into the method, so this is, since this is a repeated pool, we break this down. So the residue of this, in effect, is this. You know, here, yeah, n is two, so you have two here. Then n minus one, so it's d ds. Then you have, uh, this is, this is supposed to be s minus zero. So since s minus zero is s, so you have s squared here and s squared. So this, other one is not repeated. So we do it the normal way, 
if we just place the pole here, then this is the function. Then first thing we have to we have to get we have to do this particular math. So first of all, we simplify this. We simplify this equation as this. Then we are going to say it becomes this. Then we want to do the derivative. We want to differentiate it. So in order to differentiate it, I'm going to represent this by um, this equation. So this is actually the same thing as this. So the integration of this, you know we are differentiating with respect to s. So we have s here, we have s here, and you have s here. So you have three terms. So the first thing, so I want to do this differentiation, right? So first of all, we do this differentiation, then we do the limits, then we include this. But this will already give us one, so we, we can just omit it. The differentiation, first of all, when you want to differentiate this, so this has three terms. So you write um, the first one. So you write the first, so 0.5z is common to both, to all of them. So that's why I just brought out this 0.5z here. So you have three terms. You have exponential ms, you have this, and you have this also. So there are three terms. So the first one is you write this one. Uh, you write the first two, then you differentiate the last one. So you write the first two, then differentiate the last one. Then you write this and this and the third one, then you differentiate this. So this is what I did. I wrote this and this, then differentiate this. Then the last one, you write this and this, and you differentiate this. So you write this and this and differentiate it. So the differentiation is, so when you simplify it, you do this differentiation and simplify it, you get this. Then now you plug in the limit. So in place of S, you place it with zero. It can be simplified to this, which can be further simplified to this. At the end of the day, you get this. So the residue method for uh, this particular one, we've already gotten. Now, I want to get the residue method for at this pole. So this is much more simpler, I think. So the residue method for the second, okay. Um, so for the second method, so we're now in the second one because we separated it into two. We have two repeated poles and this particular pose, and this particular pole as S tends to minus 0 0.5. So when you multiply this out, you get this. Then when you replace in the value, instead of S, you replace in minus 0 0.5, and which can be further simplified into this. So for the first, when we broke it down, the first one we got this, then for the second one, um, we got we got um, this. Then we combine the two of them together. So this is just pure math. So when you combine it together, you get this. Then you um, you simplify it. So finally, you are going to arrive at this. So when you expand, you expanded here, then we did some simplifications, then we further, so at this point, we separated z squared, the z term, and the term that is without any coefficient. So gz comma m is given by this is given by uh, this, where A2 is given by this, A1 is given by this, 
then A naught is given by this particular uh, A naught is given by this. So I further representing uh, further represented it here. So A two given by this A one then A naught. So we already got our G Z of M. So what we actually want to get is Y Z comma M. So Y Z comma M is represented by this equation here, where this U of Z is our input, and our input is a unit step. So the Z transform of a unit step is this. So you do, we've already gotten this, we know this, and we already know this. So the next step is just to do some combinations and simplifications. And the mathematics is a little bit tedious and complex. So when you do the simplifications, uh, you arrive at um, y z of m. You arrive at this. So the final answer is given by this. So we have been able to get the modified z transform, which is given by this transfer function. And the question, the first question is to prove that when m is equal to one, the modified z transform is equal to the normal z transform we're using. So that's the first question. So this mathematics I'm doing is quite complex. For those of you that are participating, so if you have any questions, just take me back. I would, I would go over it again. So the first question, let me go to that question. The first question is to prove that, is to check that the normal Z transform gives the same result as the modified Z transform by setting M is equal to one. So we, we got Y Z comma M and we already got Y of Z in the last example we did. So we want to, be sure that the normal Z transform equals the modified Z transform when M is equal to one. And I simply told you that the modified Z transform helps us to get the output at intersampling time. So, you know, for the normal Z transform, you have Y of K and K must actually be, K must be an integer. But for the modified Z transform, M is a real number. So it has, uh, fraction and decimal part. So now, if to say what the answer we got in the modified Z transform was correct, when M is equal to one, Y of Z comma M should be equal to Y of Z. So that's what we want to prove now. So this was the value of the coefficient we got, A2, A1, and A0. And when we plug in M is equal to one, we get A2 as this. When we plug in uh, M is equal to one for this, we get our A1 to be this. Then A naught is equal to zero. That's when M is equal to one. And this was what we got for Y of Z. So in effect, this was our A2. So this is A2. This is A1, this is A1, then A0 is zero. So this is the modified Z transform. So what you are simply doing is that replacing A2, A1, A0 with the values you get here. So you're going to get this. Unfortunately for us, this was what we got as our um, Z transform of the output. So we know we are correct. So the next question is to get the value of the output when m is equal to 0 0.5. So simply replace um, 0 0.5 with m here. So replace 0 0.5 with m here. Then replace 0 0.5 with m here. So you're going to get these values, these values, these values. And so the modified Z transform when um, M is equal to 0 
is given by this. So this is A2, this is A1, and this is A0. Then we want to get the inverse, the inverse of this uh, Z transform. So similar to what we did in the first example, like I told you, you know, you ha we have three methods to get the uh, the inverse Z transform. And similar to what I explained previously, you can use a partial fraction method or the inverse formula method because this one needs to be factorized. So this, let me explain it better here. So this needs to be factorized into z minus a, z minus b, I'm sorry, in z minus c. So you need to be able to factorize this into this. So you have a, b, c because the other is three. But unfortunately, if you try to break this down into this form, you are going to get a complex number. You're going to get a complex number. And there's no way in the Z table where you can get the inverse Z transform using a complex number representation. So this has to be real. This has to be real. So that's why we cannot use a partial fraction expansion method or the inverse formula method because this cannot be broken down in this form. In this case, this, this, and this are going to be complex. And there's no way we can do the inverse Z transform when A, B, and C is complex. So uh, we have to go through the long division method. So I've written out the long division method here. So breaking it, so this is it. So it's a sum to infinity. That's why you have this dot, dot, dot. Then this is the Z form. Then in the discrete time form, you have this. So remember here, our M is 0 0.5. So where M is 0 0.5, you have zero because uh, effectively the first term is uh, zero Z minus zero. So, Z and zero. So the first one is zero. That's when M is equal to 0 0.5. Remember that this is the modified Z transform. So when um, M is equal to 1.5, so you keep increasing it in steps of one. So here is, actually here should be 0 0.5. Sorry about that. So here should be um here should be zero point five yeah one point five because now we want the intersampling time so we are not using k now we are using m where m is a real number it has decimal it has fraction so 5.5. Then this is the inverse Z transform of this since we've broken it down using the long division. So similar to what we did previously. So when M is 1.5, you have this. When M is 2.5, where M is 3.5, M is 4.5, now is in, in steps of 1.5 now. So you're just adding plus one, plus one, plus one. Now, using the modified Z transform, it helps us to be much more accurate. And let me explain using this diagram here. Yeah. So in the first example we did, 
we got y of z, which is um, getting the z transform at k sampling instance. So this for y of k. So this k is equal to one, k is equal to two, k is equal to three, k is equal to four. We stop that k is equal to five. But if you with that, if you had continue, we would go this way. But using the modified z transform, now we have 0 0.5. So the values we got at 0 0.5, we got this value. At 1.5, we got this value. At 2.5, we got this value. At 3.5, we got this value. At 4.5, we get we got this value. So 5.5. So as you can see, the modified z transform allows us to because when you're just using the normal z transform you can only get it at integer values you can only get the output at integer values but using the modified z transform you can get the values in between zero and one so in between uh two one and two in between two and three you can get in the values making us to making it to be much more accurate. So like I wrote here, using the modified Z transform, because we set M as 0 0.5, we are able to get the values at the midpoint. So if it was M is equal to 0 0.1, so we even be much more accurate than this. So we're able to get the response of the system or the output at intermediate points. And you can see it more clearly. So in the first example, where we did the final value, you know, we got the final value as one. So this is actually the output response if we had plotted it. So it will os oscillate a little bit, then later it will die down and it will rest. The final value is going to be at one. So that's the meaning of um, the final, uh, that's the interpretation of the final value. Okay, so you can see that um, you can see the usefulness of the modified Z transform. Um, but as we saw, it's, it's very complex. And uh, because of the complexity, um, most textbooks, they have the modified Z transform tables that helps in, um, in converting from the normal Z transform to the modified Z transform. Okay, so I still have some time. I still have some time left. So I'll just use my time to explain what we did in this class. Uh, in this class, we talked about how to represent continuous time signals in, the, in discrete time. That's using a computer. Um, in the normal classical control using continuous time. This is our block diagram. But now, we want to use a computer. We want to use a digital computer as our controller to control it. So we want to be able to see how a computer actually sees continuous time. That's what we are basically doing. In the last class, in order, to, in order for us to convert into the discrete time. We didn't take into account the zero order old circuit or the sampling circuit. We just um, did it directly. So, which is supposed to be ideal. But like I said, the computer doesn't see things in a continuous, uh, because it makes use of a clock. So it doesn't see things that way. So it sees, at the system in terms of discrete instances. You see the system in terms of discrete instances. So because of that, we have to take this into account and we, we need to be able to represent a continuous time system the way a computer, a digital computer, we see it. And that was what brought us to the sample and old. So for the sample and old circuits, we uh, combined the sample circuit with the zero other old circuit. 
So we started from the continuous time and we ended with the continuous time. Because when you pass it through a sampler, you are discretizing the system. And when you pass it to a zero order old, you are converting it to, to continuous time. And I said that the reason why we need to do this is because this is the way the computer says it. Having passed through a digital to analog converter and an analog to digital converter. So we want to be able to really see the system how the computer will see it. So this is the this is an example. You have the continuous time system here. You sample it, you get this, then you pass it to a zero order old. Then you get this. So using this, um, this is the actual continuous time we started with, but this is the way the computer actually sees it. So the work we did in the last class was the ideal method, the ideal case, like I said. But I said it's not ideal because this is not, we're using computers now. And this is not how the computer uh, sees, the, um, sees the system. So this is how it sees it. So by multiplying the continuous time transfer function with the zero order old, this was the model of the zero order old we got then we're able to really analyze the system exactly the way and the computer will see it. So um, this is the end of the class. So for those that participated, um, thank you for participating uh, in the class. Um, so we have few people that um, we have few people that so we have few people that came for this class today. Um, so I'll be ending the class. I don't think there is any message in the chat. Okay, all right. So those people that attended. So thank you for attending. So the uh, be on the lookout on model for the assignment based on what we based on what we uh, did in the class today. So the assignment is going to be much more research intensive, as you would say.